Cool. So we are live. Uh, hello, folks. Uh, it's Shimon here from .netos, um, and today we are having Kevin Goose with us, um, who will be talking a lot about interesting stuff. And uh, a few words about Kevin. So he's um, truly passionate about debugging, and we met several times, probably mostly online. Uh, and uh, he's a Microsoft MVP blogger, speaker at .NET conferences, and he does what he truly likes, meaning dealing with internals, debugging, and all the all the interesting bits and pieces. Uh, so um, yeah, that would be like a short introduction. Without further ado, let's move on to the presentation and good luck and have fun. All right, uh, thank you for the introduction. So uh, without any surprise today, uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, about debugging. Uh, but this time I will go one layer deeper. So uh, what do I what do I mean with that? I've talked about debugging many times in the past, uh, but this was really about uh, debugging .NET application with bugs in your C sharp code. And now I want to talk about a more insidious kind of bug, uh, the kind of bug that uh, occur in the native layer, uh, whether it's in a third-party library or even in the CLR. And uh, things can get much more complex uh, in those cases. Uh, but first, I would like just uh, to do a quick reminder of, uh, oh, sorry, there we go, of the methodology I use uh, for, for debugging. So it's quite simple, it's three steps. Uh, whenever you, you deal with a, with a new problem, the very first type is to uh, identify it. Uh, you can't do anything with the data, so you must first uh, gather all the data you can uh, about the problem. And also, you must make sure that this is uh, data that you can trust, uh, because in the past, uh, I've lost uh, countless hours investigating problem uh, based on fake data. So uh, just make sure to... Uh, validate this beforehand. And when you have the data, you still need to understand it. So uh, basically, you need to uh, try to uh, make theories about uh, what is happening. And uh, to me, this is the most difficult step because uh, this is a creative step. You won't find uh, a, a to-do list online explaining step-by-step step how to make a theories about what's happening. And here, uh, experience is going to help you a lot. And the last step that we tend to neglect, but uh, it's very important, is to verify your theory. Uh, validate every single one of your assertions. And more often than not, you will discover that your theories are actually wrong. And uh, it's OK. It's part of the process. And by discovering that your theories are wrong and by understanding why they are, uh, you will gather more data, which allow you to repeat the cycle. And every time your theories will be more and more refined until you finally uh, manage to crack the case. So uh, to demonstrate all of that, I've prepared uh, an investigation. Uh, so this is a real bug that I had to, uh, to diagnose uh, at Datadog. And so uh, to understand it, I must I first uh, must give some context. So uh, I'm working on the datadog.net tracer. What is it? Uh, it's a component that you install on your server. And then uh, without any uh, code change or recompilation, we instrument your .NET application. We detect any uh, incoming or outgoing operation, and we display that in uh, our UI. So you get a nice overview of what's going on in your application. And the way we do that is by detecting whenever your application loads uh, supported third-party libraries and we rewrite their IL code uh, at runtime. And uh, we rewrite it to inject our instrumentation code. To do so, we rely on the uh, .NET profiling API. And it turns out that uh, you can only use the profiling API with native code. Uh, you can't use managed code for that for various reasons. And because of that, a large portion of our code base is uh, written in C++. And that's why lately I've been dealing a lot with uh, bugs that comes from the interaction between managed code and native code. And it's that experience that I would like to share with you today. So 
what is uh, the problem that I'm going to talk about? Well, we have a test environment where uh, two servers are running the open source CMS Orchard and they are receiving automated traffic. And the idea behind it is that uh, one is a baseline server, uh, meaning that it runs the application as is, and uh, the other run with the Datadog instrumentation installed. And then we monitor the behavior uh, of the two servers and we try to detect any bad side effect that our instrumentation will have. And at some point we discovered that the instrumented server was crashing about once a day with an access violation. So an access violation is not something that you're supposed to get from your uh, C-sharp code unless you are using unsafe, uh, which we are not. So I immediately suspected the native part of our component. So the first thing I did is uh, looking at the code changes uh, around that time frame, but I found nothing that could explain the issue. So the next step was to configure the server to capture a memory dump uh, during the next crash. I didn't even try to reproduce the issue locally on my machine because uh, since it was happening only once per day, uh, I figured out that my chances of reproducing it locally were, were pretty slim. To automatically capture memory dump, there is a registry key to set. Uh, everything is properly documented on, on MSDN. And so uh, the, the day after, I had the memory dump uh, waiting for me. And so I opened it in uh, WinDBG. <laughs> and right ahead, uh, we can see uh, that this is indeed an access violation with an error code. We see that it happens, it happens in the CLR, in object native is log hell. And we are crashing when trying to read the memory at address 2B. So as you may already know, the lower addresses uh, in the process are marked as invalid on purpose uh, to catch uh, common programming errors such as uh, null pointers. And so here we are trying to read the memory at address uh, RCX plus 2C. And so if I just, just as a sanity check, if I inspect the value of the RCX register, we can see that it's all F, which is a hexadecimal representation of minus one. So minus one plus 2C equals 2B. Uh, so it makes sense. And so from this point, uh, the goal will be to understand why the value uh, minus one ended up in that register at that point in time, causing the crash. So the first thing I wanted to know is uh, what code was running in the server, uh, which led to the crash. So I wanted to uh, dump the uh, manage call stack. So for that, I use the CLR stack command. And here we can see that there is uh, no manage function. I only see some technical frames. So that could mean that there is some kind of corruption on the manage stack. When that happens, uh, instead I use K, which will dump the native call stack. Here we have the is local function. And here we have a bunch of functions that are not resolved. All of those functions are managed functions. So what is happening is that uh, when you compile a .NET application, uh, the final address of the method is not known yet, so it can't be written in the symbol. It will only be known uh, at execution time when the JIT compiler is going to compile the method. So a generic debugger such as WinDBG uh, cannot resolve uh, those symbols by itself. So it requires some kind of special knowledge of the CLR to find the metadata in the memory that will allow to resolve those symbols. And fortunately, the SOS extension that we loaded uh, earlier has that special knowledge. So what I can do is take the address of this, of this symbol, and then I feed it to the ip 2 md command, which stands for uh, instruction pointer to metadata, and it's going to resolve the function for me. And so here we see that it happens uh, in Orchard and more specifically in the push cache filter .disperse function. So the next step is to uh, check uh, the source code of that function. <laughs> there is a phone ringing behind me. Uh, so where is it? Uh, yeah, there we go. So I have a simplified version uh, of the code uh, right there. So this is a basic uh, implementation of the dispose pattern. 
And uh, the important part is uh, our, sorry, right there, we are calling a monitor that is entered. And the name rem reminds me a lot of uh, object native is log held. And also we are uh, locking on this object, which is an intern string. So uh, locking on intern string is a bad practice, but it's not necessarily wrong if done right. So then I decided to dig into monitor that is entered to see if it's related to is log held or not. Whenever you need to uh, dig into the uh, source code of the BCL, uh, you can check on uh, the website source of .NET, or you can use a decompiler on the .NET assemblies. And so here is the code of the, of the method. So it's uh, actually pretty simple. It's just uh, checking if the parameter is null, and then it's calling uh, is enter native. And then is enter native is a native function that is exposed to the CLR. So uh, to dig further, we're going to need the source code of the CLR. The problem is that uh, the uh, source code of the .NET framework CLR is not uh, available. Uh, Microsoft has published the source code of .NET Core, but never the one of .NET Framework. Fortunately, there is a trick. And the trick is to know that the core CLR repository on GitHub was created around the same time frame as uh, .NET 4.6. And at the very beginning, the uh, source code of .NET Core was uh, very similar to the one of uh, .NET Framework. So if you go to the core CLR repository and you check out the very first commit, you will have something that is a good approximation of the source code of uh, .NET Framework. And it may be enough for some of your investigations. So I looked into it and I uh, searched for uh, where the isentered native function is declared. And I found this macro, which, which uh, maps the isenter native symbol to the islog held function. So now we have confirmation that monitor.isenter is uh, indeed calling islog held. So then I uh, decided to look at the source code of islog held. I have it right there. So here, if you're not used to uh, reading the source code of the CLR, uh, it can get uh, a bit scary uh, because there are macros everywhere. And also it's C++. C++ is always scary. Uh, but uh, the function is actually not doing much. It's taking only one parameter, which is the object that we use for the lock. And then it's calling a get thread owning monitor lock, uh, which name is self-explanatory. Checking what thread is currently owning the lock. And then, if it finds one, it checks if the ID of that thread is the same as the ID of the current thread. And then it returns true or false depending on the reason. So, this is pretty much what we expect a uh, monitor that is entered to do. So, then I started uh, to think about what could go wrong in there. And since there is only one parameter to the function, I figured out that maybe something was wrong with this parameter. So I tried to find its value in the memory dump. So basically, I'm trying to find the value of the parameter that we give to the monitor that is enter uh, function. And normally, to do that, I would call uh, CLR stack with a dash p parameter, which uh, displays the managed call stacks with the value of every parameter. Unfortunately, <laughs> Okay, somebody is ringing at the door. Uh, online conferences are great. Uh, so, unfortunately, CLR stack is not working, uh, as, I, as I've seen earlier. So, instead, I try running a DSO for dump stack objects, which is going to browse the manage stack and uh, dump everything that looks like a pointer to uh, the manage heap. So, I was hoping to find uh, the parameter in there. So uh, there is one string somewhere, but right there, but it's not the one I'm, I'm looking for. So unfortunately, I don't have the, the parameter in there. I was starting to get a bit desperate. So then I thought, um, whenever we are calling a, a function, the value of the parameters is going to be stored in registers. And so if those registers uh, haven't been overwritten after the function has been called, I should be able to find the value in there. Uh, but to test that, I needed to know uh, what registers uh, would be used when calling the, the function. So basically, I need to know the calling convention that is used by the CLR on Windows. 
And so on Windows X64, it's using this calling convention. The first, par the first parameter, yeah, is stored in the RCX register, then the next one in RDX, then R8, and then R9. So it means that when his log held is called, uh, the value of the parameter is st stored in the RCX register. And if the RCX register was never touched until the moment of the crash, the value should still be intact and I should be able to inspect it. So uh, I looked at the disassembly. So here, this is the instruction that caused the crash. And here, this is the beginning of the method. So I know that at this point of time, in time, the RCX register uh, contains uh, the value of the parameter. And so I started checking if it was uh, modified at any point in time. Unfortunately, uh, here, just before the, the crash, uh, we overrode the value of the RCX register with some value from the memory. So uh, it was lost. Just in case, I also scanned the push instruction to see if at any point in time, we uh, push the value of the parameter to the stack where it might still be. But unfortunately, we, we never pushed it. So uh, this was a bit of a dead end. So I decided to take a step back and think about everything I discovered uh, at this point. Uh, so uh, I knew that his log held was causing the crash. I knew that his log held takes only one parameter, which is the object that I use uh, that is used for locking. And so I could think of two theories explaining uh, why my application would crash. First theory is that the address of the parameter is wrong. This is what I've tried to verify, but I couldn't find the value of the parameter. And the second theory is that uh, guest thread owning monitor lock that we are calling inside of the function is failing somehow. So this is very vague. And so uh, to move forward, I needed to refresh my knowledge uh, about how monitor works in .NET so that I could make a better theory about what's happening. And so uh, I looked for uh, articles online. And here is a summary of what I learned. So let's take a simple object. So here we have OBG with uh, a single property. And uh, when I'm going to allocate it, the uh, layout in memory is going to look like this. We have the header, then the pointer to the method table. And then we have the actual value of the fields. So here we have only uh, one field. Uh, Interesting bit of trivia, uh, when you have a pointer to that object, the pointer points to the method table pointer and not to the header like you could think at first. So we are going to focus on the header. So the header is uh, 32 bits wide, always, even in a 64-bit process. And it has two parts. The first part is 26 bits. And it's some kind of all-purpose storage that can contain either a hash code or uh, the information about the thread holding the lock in case of a sin lock, or the index of, of, a, of a sin lock. And the second part of the header is some uh, bit flags that contains, for instance, uh, information about whether the finalizer needs to run, or uh, bits that indicate uh, what kind of information is stored in the first part of the header. So I'm going to explain uh, when, uh, when and what type of information is stored in the header. So let's take a simple example. Simple example, uh, here we uh, initialize a new object. So it's going to allocate the header in memory. And then I call get hash code on this object. Assuming that you didn't override the get hash code uh, method, the runtime is expected to return a value that is unique to the object and that doesn't change over time. So uh, to return a unique value, the runtime is going to use some internal uh, random number generator. But since it needs to return the same value every time you call get hash code, it has to store it somewhere. And that somewhere is the object header. Uh, also note that since the object header has uh, 26 bits of storage, it means that when you call get hash code on an object, uh, the value uh, has actually 26 bits of entropy and not 32 bits like, like you could think. Another use case is what we call a thin lock. So uh, just like before, I create a new object 
And then I'm going to call lock on this object because on .NET, you can lock on any reference type. Uh, when you do that, what the runtime is going to do is use an atomic operation to store information about the thread in the header. Then it's going to execute the critical section. And then when it exits, it's going to clear that information from the header. And when you think about it, uh, this is one of the fastest uh, ways of implementing a lock because uh, the object header is next to the object. So you can be almost certain that it will be uh, loaded in the cache line of your CPU. And so it's going to be really fast. But uh, it's not always that straightforward. And so if we take this example of two threads uh, competing for the same lock, so just like before, uh, thread one acquires a lock and stores the information in the header, and then it starts uh, executing the critical section. Then thread two arrives and is going to inspect uh, the header of the object, and it will notice that thread one is already owning the lock. So now thread two needs to go to sleep, but it needs also to store somewhere the information that thread two is waiting for the lock to be uh, to be freed, so that uh, something uh, something wakes up thread two when the lock is freed. Sorry. So basically, we need to store some kind of waitlist, and this way, when thread one exits the lock, it can uh, check the waitlist and wake up any thread that is waiting for the lock. Unfortunately, we can't store that in the header because it is already full. So where are we going to store that? Another case that is problematic is uh, this simple code. Uh, just like before, I create a new, an object. Then I call uh, get hash code. So the runtime is going to generate a random number and store it in the header. And then I lock on this instance. So the runtime is going to use an atomic operation to store the thread information in the header except that it's already full. So where is the runtime going to store that? So in all those scenarios, whenever the runtime needs to store something in the header, but it's already full, it will instead use what we call the sync table. So the sync table is a table that is stored somewhere in memory. And the idea is that the runtime will uh, scan the table uh, to find the next uh, free entry. And it will replace whatever information is in the header with the index of that entry. And every entry is uh, two pointers, uh, one back pointer to the object, and one pointer to uh, another chunk of memory that is named the sync block. And the sync block is big enough to store uh, all the information needed uh, about the log or the hash code or really anything. So now that we know that, we can uh, go back to the problem and refine the series. So uh, the crash could be explained by uh, the address of the parameter being wrong, or the sync table being corrupted, or the sync block index that is stored in the object header being corrupted. So in both cases, we have some kind of corruption, but in one case, it's in the sync table, and in the other case, it's in the object header. So how can we verify those theories? Well, since I'm uh, focusing on the sync, sync block, on the sync table, sorry, I can use the sync blk command, which will um, read the sync table and dump any sync block that is currently used by a lock. And so here it found one. And interestingly, when trying to uh, read the thread information, it fails uh, with this error. Uh, so that's very interesting because we are suspecting some kind of corruption. And here we have an error when trying to inspect the value. So uh, then I try running a sync blk all which will read all the sync table and dump all the sync blocks and not just the ones that are used by a lock. And so here we see that the last one at index 226 is the one that failed with an error. So here I'm not able to conclude whether it means that uh, the sync blk command uh, stops at the first error or if this is really the last block of the sync table or if the sync table is so corrupted that it cannot be read past this point. But in any case, since I, ha uh, since I have some evidence that uh, the memory is corrupted somehow, I decided to pause my investigation until I get another memory dump. So why is that? 
Uh, the problem is that uh, memory correction could be completely random. Uh, for instance, imagine you have uh, some part of the code that writes to a wrong pointer. At some point, it will overwrite uh, data in the same table, but maybe the next time it will overwrite uh, data at a completely different part of the memory. And so uh, I shouldn't spend too much time on the sync table before confirming whether the crash is random or not. Uh, fortunately, by this point, I had another dump uh, waiting for me. So I have it uh, right there. And so when I open it with uh, WinDBG, I see just like before an access violation with the same code. We see that it happens again in his log held, and we see that we are reading the memory at address 2B. So this looks like uh, exactly like the previous crash, uh, which is great. Because uh, random crashes are much harder to, to diagnose. So just like before, I tried looking at the managed core stack, just like before it failed. So then I looked at the native uh, core stack and resolved uh, the top symbol. And just like before, this is uh, happening in Orchard in output cache filter dispose. So it looks really like the previous crash, which is great. So then I try to inspect uh, the sync blocks. And this time we have no error. Uh, we find uh, three sync blocks that are currently used by a lock. And uh, interestingly, uh, one of them has uh, no owner. So basically the lock is orphaned. Uh, which happens if a thread acquires a lock and then dies before freeing it. So you're not supposed to get orphan lock. So I decided to look at the source code of Orchard to understand uh, where it could happen. And so uh, what I found is that uh, basically Orchard is an ASP.NET MVC application and it's using uh, two different events as part of its locking mechanism. Uh, during controller.onaction executing is going to acquire the lock. And then during action filter.onResult executed, it's going to release the lock. Uh, this is a call to output cache filter.dispose that we've seen previously. And the thing is, uh, for that to work, uh, you need uh, that both events are raised on the same thread because uh, you can't acquire a lock from one thread and free it from another. But ASP.NET makes absolutely no guarantee about uh, what thread is going to raise what event. And that's how you can end up with orphan locks. Uh, so having orphan lock uh, is not great, but it shouldn't crash the application. So uh, there is still something missing uh, in the picture. So at this point, I decided that it was time to uh, stop messing around and focus on where exactly the crash is happening. So basically, what I needed is uh, to understand uh, this native code so that I know where in the islog held function we are crashing. Uh, I'm going to close this memory then because it's the other one. So basically, I need to make sense of this. Well, I don't know about you, but personally, when I read that, I don't understand anything. Uh, I know what most of those instructions are doing individually, most, not all of them, but I can't uh, reconstruct the uh, flow of the program mentally like I would do with some C sharp code. Uh, but luckily, in that case, uh, we have already uh, the source code of the islog held function. So, what we need to do is to map the native instruction to the C source code. And the way I proceed for that is uh, first I look for instructions that are easy to recognize. So what I mean is, for instance, this one, we are reading the memory at some address. And uh, thanks to the symbols, this address is reserved to uh, the G underscore pissing table field. So that means that if I look uh, in the source code of the is -lock help function and I find a line that is reading the uh, G underscore pissing table field, I know that this line of code is mapped to this instruction. So I checked is lock held. Unfortunately, we are never using pissing table. When that happens, it usually means that one of the functions that is being called has been inline during compilation. So it just means that you also have to inspect uh, the functions that are being called. So we are going to look into uh, get thread owning monitor lock. 
So there is a lot more stuff happening there. Uh, I'm not going to uh, explain it uh, right now. But what is interesting is right there, we are uh, reading uh, G underscore pissing table, which is exactly what we were looking for. And also we are lucky because this is the only place on the whole function where we are reading it. So we know for sure that this line of code is mapped to the native uh, instruction that we've seen. So then I kept looking around for interesting stuff. And here we have two if conditions where we are checking if some bits are set. And in the uh, native assembly, we have two calls to the BT instruction. And BT stands for bit test. And as the name indicates, it checks if, one, if some bits in particular are set. So there is a good chance that those two BT instructions are associated to those if uh, in the C++ code. To verify that, I check the value of the constants that we are testing. So for instance, a uh, sync block is a hash code. This is the binary representation, and it means check if the 27th bit is set. And uh, 1a in hexadecimal is 26. So it means that uh, this constant is tested in that line. So you might think, uh, why 26, since we are checking the 27th bit? And the trick is that the bit instruction is zero based. So bt0 is going to test uh, if the first bit is set. And 20, 20, bt26 is going to test if the 27th bit is set. And so the same way, I checked the value of the other constant. It means uh, check if the 28th bit is set. And 1b is 27. And so uh, we are testing this constant in this instruction. And every time I was able to map a native instruction to the C++ source code, I annotated the code with my finding. And the goal is little by little to reconstruct the mental image of what is happening in that function. Sorry. Uh, so then I kept looking for interesting stuff. And right there, we have test RCX RCX. Whenever you are testing a register against itself, uh, you can be almost sure that this is going to be either a null check or a false Boolean check. And so if I inspect the source code, I see that we have a null check right there. So there is a good chance that this line is mapped to this instruction. Uh, if that's the case, that will mean that this thread is stored in the RCX register. So then let's see where it comes from. We see that RCX comes from RDX plus eight. And then RDX comes from RAX plus RCX times eight. And then RAX is uh, the result of reading uh, the piecing table field. So given that a uh, piecing table will be stored in the RAX register, then RAX plus RCX times eight sounds a lot like if we are reading the sync table at a given index with the index being stored in the RCX register. So that will mean that this instruction is associated to this code. So assuming this is the case, it means that the result, the uh, pointer to the sync block, PSB, is stored in the RTX register. And then uh, we uh, read the memory at address RTX plus 8. And so that will be uh, when we call uh, get monitor and we fetch the M underscore holding thread. So it's a bit of a stretch. So we need to verify that before uh, moving forward. And so basically, we're trying to verify if uh, reading the memory at uh, address RDX plus 8 is the same thing as calling get monitor on the sync block and fetching the M underscore holding thread. Uh, in other words, since we know that uh, in the RDX register we have uh, the sync block, we are trying to find what is stored as the address RDX plus 8. And so to find out, first we uh, check what the get monitor function is doing. It's returning uh, a pointer to the M underscore monitor field, and it interprets that as an aware lock. So then we check the structure of the sync block, and we see that M underscore monitor is the first field of the class. And in memory, the fields are going to be stored in the same order as they are declared in the code. So M underscore monitor is the first field of the class. So it's going to be stored at the beginning of the object at address zero. So then we check uh, the structure of the overlock. 
and the OER log as uh, three fields. The first one, M underscore monitor head, is going to be stored at the beginning of the object, so at address zero, right there. And uh, it's a long, a long in C++ is four bytes, so it's going to end at offset 0x4. Then the next field is M underscore recursion, so it's going to be stored right after the previous one, so it's going to be stored at offset 4. And it's an inside long, so it's going to be four bytes, so it's going to end at 0x8. And then we have M underscore holding thread, which is a field that we are looking for. And so it's going to be stored at offset 0x8. And so just like that, we've confirmed that uh, this native instruction and this line of code uh, are doing the same thing. So I went back to the uh, assembly and annotated it. And at this point, I felt like we had uh, enough information to focus on the crash itself. So uh, starting from uh, from there, we have if this thread equal null. And so test RCX RCX, uh, the way it's going to work is um, it's going to set the zero flag of the CPU if RCX is zero. So it's going to set it if this thread is null. Then uh, we have uh, the GE instruction. The way GE works is uh, it's going to jump to the target address if the zero flag of the CPU is set. So it's going to jump if this thread was null. And then we have the line that caused the crash. If we got there, it means that we didn't jump at the previous instruction. So it means that the zero flag of the CPU wasn't set. So it means that this thread wasn't null. So we were in the else branch of the if. And so that would mean that uh, we crashed when uh, calling get thread ID on uh, the piece thread object. So that's something else that we're going to verify. And so uh, get thread ID is uh, trying to fetch uh, the ID of the thread. And so we are going to verify just like before if the thread ID is stored at offset 2C. So this is the same verification as before, but without the fancy drawings. So we have the structure of the thread class and we are going to count all the memory before the M underscore thread ID field to see if the M underscore thread ID field is at offset 2C. And so uh, thread state is four bytes and sign long is four bytes. Then we have three pointers. This is a 64-bit process, so every pointer is eight bytes. Then we have a D world, D world is four bytes. And then we have the M underscore thread ID field. If we do the math, it means that we have 36 bytes of memory before the thread ID. But 2C is 44. So uh, it doesn't match the values that we were expecting to find. So does it mean that my theory was wrong? Well, not quite, because uh, if you pay close attention, you will see that thread inherits from INNone. And INNone is a class that uh, declares some uh, abstract methods. And so thread is going to have some virtual methods. And in C++, if your object has some virtual methods, it's going to declare a V table. And the V table will be exposed at the very beginning of the object, well, a pointer to the V table. So it's exactly like if uh, during compilation, um, an extra field was insert, uh, inserted at the beginning of your object, and that extra field is a pointer to the V table. And uh, since it's a 64-bit process, the pointer is going to be 8 bytes. And so if we redo the math uh, by taking those 8 bytes into account, we find 44. And so we have the confirmation that the thread ID is stored at offset 2C. And so we have the confirmation that uh, the crash is caused by calling get thread ID on P thread. And that will mean that the value of P thread is minus 1. Because if you remember at the very beginning, we've seen that we are crashing because we are reading uh, the memory at address minus 1 plus 2C. So then what is interesting to find out is where does this thread comes from? So I'm going to go back to the get thread owning monitor log function. And this time I'm going to uh, explain what it's doing. So first, uh, it calls getBits, which is going to uh, read the header of the object that we give to the uh, isLockHead function. And then it's going to check if uh, sub uh, bit flags are set. So if you remember, I explained that the header has two parts, a 26-bit storage, and then six bits of uh, flags 
that indicate, among other things, uh, what is stored in the in the header. And so uh, we know that is hash or sync block index is set because uh, we went there. Basically, we we know that we went through the if because if we went through the else, then we wouldn't have reached the instruction that caused the crash. And so here we know that uh, the is hash code bit is set because we went there. And so at this point, we know that uh, the bit that indicate whether the header is storing a hash or a sync block index is set, and the bit that indicates whether the sync block is storing a hash code is set. Uh, is not set, sorry, that's the other way around. So that means that uh, we know that the header is storing the index to a sync block. Then we apply a bit mask to find this index. And then we read the sync table at that index and we fetch a pointer to the sync block. So if you remember my explanation of the sync table earlier, uh, basically we have in the header the index of an entry in the sync table. And in that entry, we have a pointer to the sync block and we are currently fetching this pointer. So we store it in PSB. Then uh, we inspect the sync block to find the information about the lock and more specifically, uh, what thread is currently owning the lock. And we store that in pthread. And then we get to uh, pthread, get thread ID, which causes the crash. So that means that we have uh, the value minus one that is stored in the M underscore holding thread field. Uh, is there a way to verify that? Well, to verify that, we will need to find the address of the sync block. And uh, in the disassembly, we figured out that at this point in time, the RDX register is uh, storing the address of the sync block. And fortunately, past this point, uh, the value of the RDX register didn't change. So it means that it should still contain the address of the sync block. And so uh, if I go back to WinDBG and I uh, check the value of the RDX register, this should be the address of the sync block. And in fact, if I look for it in the uh, output, we can see that we had this value right there in the sync block command when we were dumping the sync table. And interestingly, this is the one sync block that was orphan. And then we can inspect the value of uh, this sync block in memory by using the, oh, sorry, the dd command for dump the world is going to dump the value in chunks of four bytes. And then, we can use the structure of aware lock to interpret those values. So basically, m underscore monitor held is going to be the first four bytes. So it's going to be one. m underscore recursion is going to be one. And then m underscore holding thread, which is the value we are looking for, is going to be the next pointer. So it's going to be uh, all f's and is going to be minus one. So we have the confirmation that the value minus one was stored uh, for the M underscore holding thread in the sync block and this caused the crash. But we still don't know how the value minus one ended up in the sync block to begin with. Fortunately, uh, minus one is a value that is very easy to recognize. And so I was able to scan the source code of the CLR to find all the places where we are storing a minus one in the M underscore holding thread field. Unfortunately, there is only one. This is in the object header getting block function. And this is a function that is called uh, when you have a sync lock. And then the runtime tries to store more information in the header and it can't. And so it's going to promote it to a sync block. So this happened in this function. And so in the code, we have uh, the part that store minus one in this thread. And we have this very interesting command saying the lock is orphaned which is consistent with everything we've seen so far. And so uh, we get there when pthread is null, and pthread comes from a synlog thread ID dispenser, ID to thread with validation. So let's see what this function is doing. So I'm not going to explain uh, this code, but uh, what you need to know is that it takes an ID and it's return a pointer to a thread. And internally, it uses some kind of table to do the mapping. So uh, why would the runtime need to do that? Well, remember previously when I explained the scene lock, I said that uh, the runtime is going to store some information about the thread in the object header, 
but I never explain what kind of information. Well, ideally, the runtime will need the address of the thread. The problem is that the address is going to be 32 or even 64 bits, depending on the bitness of the process. And we have only 26 bits of usable space in the header, so it cannot fit. So instead, the runtime is going to store the ID of the thread. So you might think, how is that helping? Because we are still trying to store 32 bits inside of 26. And the trick is that the runtime is going to aggressively reuse the IDs of the threads to keep it under uh, 26 bits. So what I mean is as soon as a thread is going to die, its ID is going to be reused by the next thread that spawns. And so to get above the 26 bits, you need to have more than 67 million threads alive at the same time. And given that every thread has one megabit, one megabyte of stack, uh, you're going to run out of memory way before even getting near this limit. And that's why nobody has ever hit it. But the runtime still needs uh, the thread address, not the ID. And so it's also going to keep a table to fetch the thread, ID, uh, the thread address from the ID. And this is the uh, scene log thread ID dispenser that we've seen previously. So what do we know at this point? We know that the access violation is caused by the value minus one stored as a thread address in a sync block. We know that this happens when a sync lock is promoted to a sync block, but the thread ID is missing from the table, which begs the question, in what condition can the thread ID be missing? We also know that the thread IDs are aggressively reused to keep the max ID under 26 bits. And so because of that, the table is going to be cleaned whenever the finalizer of a thread object is running. So as soon as a, as a thread dies and is collected, the uh, runtime is going to remove its entry from the table. And so uh, if a lock is promoted after uh, the entry has been removed from the table, the runtime will be unable to find the address uh, of the thread. And so it will store minus one instead in the sync block, and that would cause the crash. So at this point, I felt like I had a complete understanding of the, of the issue. So I tried writing a repro just to confirm that I got everything right. So in this program, I'm just creating a bunch of objects. So it's just new objects and storing them in an array. And then I enumerate. And uh, for each of those objects, I'm going to spawn a thread, and the thread is going to uh, acquire the lock. So at this point, the header of the object is empty. So the runtime is going to use a thin lock and store the ID of the thread in the header of those objects. And then I uh, wait for my threads to die. And I force the garbage collection to make sure that the thread finalizer run, and it's going to uh, remove the ID from the mapping table in memory. Then uh, I iterate on those objects and I call get hash code. When I call get hash code, the runtime is going to generate a random number and try to store that in the object header. But the object header is already full, so it's going to uh, find a free entry in the sync table and move all this data to a sync block. When doing so, it's going to try to reserve uh, the ID of the thread to fetch the, the address but it won't find it in the table. And so it's going to store minus one instead uh, in the sync block. And at this point, I have all the condition needed for the crash. And so I just iterate on the object and I call monitor.isentered, which will uh, execute the uh, line of code that will read the memory at address minus one plus two bit, plus two C, sorry. And so if I run that, uh, indeed uh, I have a crash. So uh, I don't see the access violation because uh, this is running with a debugger, but we can see that this is the same error code and I can confirm you that this is uh, indeed uh, the same crash. So uh, just to wrap things up, there are still a few uh, weird things about this problem. Uh, the first question is why is the baseline server not crashing? Because if you remember in the test environment, we have two servers and uh, only the one that is not using the data dog instrumentation uh, is working and the other one is crashing. And the idea is that Orchard used a finite set of lock as part of his cache mechanism. And uh, so basically it's, it's caching the output of the page. 
And because we use uh, automated traffic, we always access the same page. And so our chat is going to always use the same two logs. And for the crash to happen, uh, you need an orphan lock to be promoted after the parent thread is collected, which is a very specific set of condition. And uh, the thing is, after all the locks are promoted, uh, if the conditions for the crash were not renewed, then it cannot happen anymore. Because uh, since it happens during only during the promotion, when everything has been promoted, you can't crash anymore, even if you let your server run for days. And the problem is that uh, the instrumented server is redeployed every time we make a change to our code base, which happens multiple times per day. Whereas the baseline server is never restarted uh, because we don't need to restart it. And so uh, the only reason why only the instrumented server was crashing is because uh, this is the only one that we are restarting. Uh, the other question is what has started the incident because this bug has been in .NET for years. And in fact, I think it's still in .NET to this day. Uh, so why did it start someday? And uh, this time it's because of us. Uh, basically, uh, to better test uh, the application, we added some asynchronous uh, workload. And um, by default, our child used a synchronous controller. And because we added some asynchronous uh, workload, we switched it to uh, an asynchronous controller. And uh, for the log to be orphaned, you need uh, the on action executing and the on result executed events to be raised on separate thread. And this is an implementation detail, but when you have a synchronous controller, uh, those two events are always going to be raised on the same thread. And by switching to an asynchronous controller, we created the conditions for the crash. All right, so uh, that concludes uh, this investigation. Uh, in summary, uh, the more complex investigation, the more important it is to verify every theory. So here you see that uh, every time I suspected something, I checked it or double checked it. And by doing that, um, I could be sure that uh, every, time, uh, every time I make a step, I move forward. Basically, I never have to backtrack because I know that everything I found at this point has been verified and is true. And when dealing with very complex investigations, this is important because you will be lost very quickly. Uh, also, uh, when you deal with uh, some area which you are not comfortable with, for instance, for me, it was the monitors, uh, take some time to uh, step aside and uh, refresh your knowledge about the subject because it will help you to uh, make more refined theories about what is happening. And last but not least, don't give up. Uh, Raymond Chen uh, said that uh, debugging is an exercise in optimism, and I, I think that's the case. Uh, it's uh, very easy to be discouraged when uh, your theories uh, keep being wrong, but this is part of the process. And uh, if you uh, keep the motivation and keep trying, uh, sooner or later, you will be able to crack the case. And uh, I have uh, more investigation uh, available on my on my blog if you if you like this one. Thank you. That was awesome. I ran all out of the popcorn in my whole room, <laughs> and that was the very first session. So, thank you for uh, for presenting and for sharing with us. Uh, I think we are pretty tight with the uh, with the timeline, so yeah. um, we will not run any Q and A. But thank you for being with us and for. Thank you for making that happen. So, uh, and for all of you folks, uh, stay on this channel and we are getting back in a few minutes. So thank you again, Kevin. Uh, take care and have a good evening. Thanks, see ya.